Okay, welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to cover two kingdoms, the protists and the fungi. And um, this is quite a complex group and they've also often been mislabeled in, historically into other kingdoms. So uh, with that in mind, keep in mind we're going to be looking at different characteristics. So we'll start with the protists. Protists can be eukaryotic, they're all eukaryotic, but they can be unicellular, colonial, or multicellular. Some protists, like brown algaes, can get over 20 meters long, um, and they have a variety of metabolic styles. They have, you know, chemical autotrophism, chemical heterotrophism, you know, regular photoautotrophism, etc. There are three basic types of protists. The protozoans are the ones that act like animals, the algae are the ones that act like plants, and the slime molds are the ones that act like fungus. So basically Kingdom Protista is the catch-all kingdom for the organisms that don't fit in the other three eukaryotic kingdoms. Protozoans are, are heterotrophic because they're animal-like, they're unicellular and they're classified by how they're mo they move. They have several different lifestyles though. They can be free living, parasitic, or mutualistic. Sarcodines are um, the amoeba group. They move by pseudopodia, which means false feet. Some of them have shells, some don't, and they all reproduce by using binary fission, which looks like mitosis but on a cellular level. So most of the little pseudopods are used for movement and feeding. In amoebas, the shape are constantly changing, and food is stored in food vacuoles, which then merge with lysosomes for later digestion. The contractile vacuole that you see here is for water regulation. Ciliates are another type of um, protist. They're another type of um, protozoan and they have lots and lots of cilia which are short hair-like uh, structures on the cell membrane. So they both move with cilia and also use them to feed. The most common one is paramecium and you will need to know this diagram. And if you notice that paramecium have two types of nuclei, the macronucleus and the micronucleus. The micronucleus is basically a sexual um, nucleus. In other words, it gets transferred to another paramecium during sexual reproduction, but they can also reproduce asexually through binary fission. Flagellates, well, they move with flagella, which are longer and whip-like instead of short and hair-like. Some of the important ones are trypanosoma, which causes sleeping sickness, personympha, which is found in the guts um, of some animals, and trichonympha, which is found in the guts of per, um, termites and it helps them to digest cellulose. Sporozoans are the last kind of animal-like protist, and they're called sporozoans because they send out spores. They don't move on their own. One of the most important sporozoans is shown here in this life cycle, and that's for malaria, which kills lots and lots of people all the time. Algae are the plant-like protists. These include euglenoids, diatoms, dinoflagellates, and the multicellular algaes. The euglenoids are characteristic of euglena. That's where they get their name. You will need to notice uh, multiple things on this diagram. Specifically, besides the flagellum, which is why it's in this group, also the eye spot. Take a look at the eye spot. Now the eye spot is there for euglena because it helps them to identify where the light is and to swim toward it so that they can perform more photosynthesis. Diatoms are considered golden brown algae. They have a two-part shell which is made of silica. Um, silica is the same thing as glass. They're responsible for most of the oil consumed that is spilled in the environment. So, for example, when there's an oil spill because a tanker um, ran aground or whatever. It's the diatoms that tend to sequester that oil and prevent it from causing problems. Diatoms are also extremely important in making oxygen, glass, in gardening, and in toothpaste. They're also used in food preservation. 
The dinoflagellates have two flagella in the little groove that you can see around the middle of each one of those. Dinoflagellates can often cause diseases to animals. They are photosynthesizers, but when they have a bloom, they're called a red tide, and that produces toxins, which can, which can harm a lot of organisms. Multicellular algae can be between microscopic to 20 meters in length. They're classified by color, so they come in green, brown, and red, and these are typically what we call seaweed. They have a great deal of importance to um, humans because we use m m the extracts from these seaweeds to make um, alginates, which are binders in things like ice cream. We also use them to make agar, which helps us in the medical field to identify organisms that are causing disease in people. So they're quite important. The slime molds are the last group of the protists, and they are fungus-like. They typically are small, and there's a, they are a very small group as well, but they also tend to be very brightly colored. They have changes in form during their life cycle, so they go from what's called a um, fruiting form to the migrating slug stage, and they literally actually move across the table. Uh, one guy that worked in the biology department where I went to undergraduate school used to keep one on his table and you would watch this bright yellow blob crawling across his table. You often find these guys in damp locations just like you would find them, you know, most fungi. So let's move on to that kingdom. Fungi typically are multicellular they're all external heterotrophs, which means that they digest their food outside of their bodies and then absorb it. Their cell walls are made of chitin, and they can reproduce both sexually and asexually. This is the typical structure of a fruiting body of a club fungus. And um, so this is the typical type of mushroom that people eat. You will need to know that it has a cap and a, a stalk um, but the one thing that we're going to focus on mostly with the fungi are the mycelia. As I said before, uh, they perform extracellular digestion. And fungi often perform the roles of either decomposers, parasites, or mutualists. If they are parasites, they use special structures called hostoria. And you can see those invading the cells in this picture and that's how they become parasitic because the hostoria are what send out the digestive enzymes and then they absorb it. As I said before, they can reproduce asexually or sexually in this group and um, all of the fungi groups are named by their sexual spores. So asexually they can reproduce through fragmentation or budding or asexual spores Sexually, they always reproduce through spores. The zygomycetes um, are a group of fungi that have very thick-walled sexual spores, and you can see the thick-walled spore over in the bottom right-hand side. It's called a zygospore. The most common example of a zygomycete is Rhizopus uh, stellonifer, or black bread mold. The ascomycetes have ascospores, and they're called the cup fungi. And you can see up at the top why it's generally called cup fungi. But morels are also in this group. Yeast, common yeast that we use for bread baking or for brewing is in this group. And also ringworm is in this group. So that is a skin infection. So since it's a skin infection and that makes it parasitic, you would know that it has hostoria. The basidiomycetes are the club fungi, and that's because their sexual spores are, call, are very club-like in shape. Some examples are the common mushrooms, bracket fungi, stinkhorns, puffballs, etc. One of the things that people see when they see the, the puffballs especially is they like to stomp on them. 
what happens is anytime you see a fungus, then what you're seeing is the fruiting body, which means that it's ready to produce its spores and spread it. So when you kick a puff ball and it puffs, those are spores in that puff. All of these, if you chop it up, you're creating more. So you're not destroying the problem in your yard, for example, you're encouraging it. The deuteromycetes are the ones called the imperfect fungi, and that's because they have no sexual spores. Um, they perform only asexual reproduction, usually through budding, and some examples are penicillium and conidia. Penicillium is what's pictured here, and that's obviously the really important one because it produces penicillin, which is um, and, uh, the earliest antibiotic we've ever used. Most people know that fungi can cause diseases, and you can see like skin diseases here on the child's face, um, but they can also create some interesting stuff. The crop pest part is referring to ergot, or black wheat smut, and you can see that a picture of the wheat over on the top right picture. When people ate this, they would do what's called St. Vitus's dance, and that's a reaction to the toxins in the body, and it would cause people to jerk and twitch. The other thing is, is that with black wheat smut, it also causes, it produces a toxin, an alkaloid, that is very similar to the properties of LSD. And so it causes mass hallucinations and panic. And there is quite a bit of evidence that this caused most of the major panic and mob rule that was found in both um, the French Revolution times, because the poor people only got the rust-infected or smut-infected wheat to grind their bread, and also during the Salem witch trials. So um, that caused that mob mentality, and it was often due to the effects of it. And recent research has shown that um, those toxins survived the baking process, so it is very likely that this did actually happen. We also make food from different fungi. We get breads, we get um, beers, which used to be called the poor man's bread in the Middle Ages because yeah, it was how they got their calories. Um, we also make, use it to ferment to make things like soy sauce. And finally, we use medicines. In World War II, the first use of antibiotics was used widely, and that was penicillin. And penicillin saved more than half of all the lives of injured uh, soldiers throughout World War II. And since that time, it has created a massive amount of survivability. However, there's a downside to that in that we're now having antibiotic-resistant um, bugs, which we covered back on the Natural Selection lecture. So if you have any questions regarding that, you may want to review that lecture. So by all means, please practice with this material, and I wish you a good day.